Okay, so okay, so Stephen, I'm going to let I'm going to let you be the one who kind of monitors the technicalities here. Right? Yeah, sounds good. And and I'm I'm going to mostly just concentrate on the presentation. So, so first of all, welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We really do appreciate that you you know want to use some of your time for this uh, Marxism 101 course. Now, this is not a heavy academic course. We're trying to keep it as um, accessible as possible for everybody. So there's the readings will be very brief, but as, as you will see, if, if you looked at the course outline I sent out, there's already some links there to you know, full length work. So you can we can dive into other readings as as deeply as you wish so if you went through all of those readings that were just listed on that page that by itself would probably be the equivalent of a of a semester course so but what we will what we're going to do is just have half a dozen sessions of about an hour and a half each and try to keep the presentations brief and so that we can maximize the time that's available for discussion I will just, before we actually begin, I will just uh, remind you all that we are on Indigenous territories, that the Communist Party of Canada fully supports the rights of Indigenous people to self-government and control over and veto power over development of their own resources, and that we, we will support those struggles to the fullest. So on to the course. I, as I, as I said to you initially in, in, the, in the first uh, uh, message I sent out, this is not going to result in us all becoming really high level scholars of Marxism. But I hope by the end of these sessions that everybody will have a working understanding of the definition of Marxism to the point that you'll know whether you're a Marxist or not. And if you find that you are, you can act accordingly. So this first session is, in fact, I think, probably the most difficult. It contains the most, the, the largest number of concepts. And some of these are concepts that we just know from experience people have trouble with. It can be a struggle to keep track of all the different ideas and get them put together simultaneously to get a real understanding. But it's a necessary step because this is, this is the session which is basically about how capitalism works and what profit is and where it comes from. So without more ado, I'll try and run through uh, what I actually have to say about that. In fact, I think I will actually share my screen as I go through the notes that I have for this. I will, send the, I will also send these notes out to you later on. So, so we're talking about capitalism and what capitalism is essentially is the system where the owners of capital invest it in the production of commodities for the sake of selling them at a profit. That is, the purpose of a commodity is to be sold. It's not where anybody's producing what's directly of any use to them. And the value of a commodity is what is, is has to do with um, what price it's going to be sold at. It, is, it has no moral content. We're not talking about values. We're talking about value as, a, as a, an economic category, um, which is, we can be looked at objectively without bringing any, any moral questions about the worthiness or the social utility of a commodity. Commodities are just things produced for the purpose of being sold. And, what determines the value of a commodity is the socially necessary labor time to produce it. Now, that's actually a, a really packed phrase. So we have to go through like all the different aspects of it. Now, labor time, for a start, is essentially work measured in hours. Now, more highly skilled labor is going to be measured at on a weighted scale. Like an hour of highly skilled time is worth more than an hour of unskilled labor. But for the purposes of understanding this process, we can just think of regular ordinary labor time where an hour of labor is, is the same as any other hour of labor. 
whether it's somebody working in one factory or another or in the bakery or driving a bus or whatever. So labor time is measured in hours and socially necessary labor time is the amount of time that it requires to produce a commodity under the normal conditions of production for that society with the given technology and techniques and forms of organization that are available in that society. So socially necessary labor time includes tools, materials, and live labor. The tools, the machines that are used are, you know, the, the wear and tear on the machines has to be figured in. The, the machines themselves are, are also commodities which required labor, labor time to produce them. So the initial value of the machines crystallizes a certain amount of labor. And that value is sort of amortized over the, the life of that machine as it's used to produce other commodities. There's the value of the materials that goes into it, which are also commodities, which require a certain amount of labor time to produce them. And we can think of materials as basically going in and coming out without any change in their value, because they were already something of some value which required some labor time to produce them. And then there's the current living labor, the labor that's required to, to produce a new commodity using those machines from, the, from those materials or that were introduced into the beginning of the production process. So each step, each, each commodity may actually be the result of many different stages of production, but a certain amount of value is, a, is in crystallized, is embodied in each of the commodities, which is an input to the next stage of production. So the overall final commodity, whatever it is, embodies that all that value of all the different kinds of labor that were required to produce it. Again, remember, we're measuring labor essentially in hours, the amount of time. And uh, the, the price of commodities can fluctuate up and down according to supply and demand, but essentially it fluctuates around its real value, which is the amount of labor required to produce it. So no matter how how much the supplier demand for cars, for example, changes, or the supply or demand for toothpicks. A toothpick is just never going to be cost as much as a car. Its real value is less because less labor time was required in its, in its production. Another point before we really dive into where profits come from, I want to emphasize that Profit can be made when commodities are exchanged at their true value. That is, when equal each, commodities have equal value if equal amount of labor time was required to produce them. And pro profits are made when they're exchanged in that way. A commodity doesn't have to be sold above its value to make a profit. Any kind of selling above its value is just what you gain on the swings you lose on the roundabout. I mean, if anybody's selling above value, somebody else is losing by having to pay more or by having to sell below value. But the overall economy profits can be made overall when commodities are exchanged at their real value. So, so where does this profit come from? Well, it comes from surplus labor. So here, this is where, again, this is a, this is a, a concept which a lot of people struggle with. So I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to explain it and possibly <laughs> re-explain it several times, go over this idea. And that's the distinction between labor power and labor. Labor power is a commodity with a price like any other commodity in the capitalist market. That is, workers sell their labor power to employers. Here again, we're not talking about human beings as entities with rights or feelings. We're just talking about human beings as commodities. What they have to sell is their labor power, their potential to do work. And again, this is a commodity and its value is determined by the amount of socially necessary labor time required to produce it. That is all the work that went, went into uh, raising and training the, the existing worker and the next generation to replay them, re, to replace them once they've been used up and have been retired. But 
Uh, on the other hand, you have labor, which is measured, essentially measured in hours, which is a measure of value. Labor as time is not a commodity. People aren't selling their labor as time. They're selling their labor power, their potential to, to, to do labor. So you might like to think of it as like the distinction between the price of fuel and the amount of heat that, that you, or energy you can produce when you burn it. Like the price of the fuel is, or, or maybe we should say the value of the fuel is the amount of labor power required to produce it, like all the work that went into uh, creating the machine, machines with which the oil and gas was drilled for and dug up and processed and transported and so on, and, and all the labor that went into that. That's the value of the fuel in the market. The, the number of BTUs that, get, that comes out when you burn it is simply distinct from that. And labor power is just as much distinct from labor as, as the cost of fuel or the price of fuel is from the amount of energy that comes out when you burn it. It's, it's just two different things. So again, we know that this is, this is a concept that people have, you know, will sometimes have struggled with, take some time to grasp. So I'll go, <laughs> I'll, I'll try going over it again. So. So labor power is a commodity. That's what workers are selling to their bosses. And it, it's a commodity like any other. Its value is the socially necessary labor time required to produce it. So what that means is however much in the way of resources has to be put in of other people's labor to raise children, to, to educate them, to train them for jobs. Um, and then the, you know, the necessary work that's required to house people, to feed people, um, you know, to you know, to treat to treat them medically, to move them back and forth to to the to the job, all the things that that go into just people managing to live, to be in a fit enough condition to show up at work the next day, and to replace themselves so that there's a next generation of workers. That's the socially necessary labor time required to produce labor power, is all the work that goes into creating a worker. Now, we, we recognize different amounts of training and education are required to produce labor power of different skill levels. So they'll have less, greater or lesser value because more or less labor time was required to produce them. So that you can think of the education costs of producing an, um, an engineer or a surgeon is greater than the engineer, than the education costs to create uh, a waitress or, or a daycare worker. And so once again, the value of, a, of an engineer's labor power is greater than the value of a, of a daycare worker's labor power. This is not a moral value. This is an economic one. Nothing can make a daycare worker as valuable as, as a commodity, as an engineer will be. So, you know, we can, we can have our own moral values. We can consider that a daycare worker is, you know, who's taking care of children is of much more value than say, an engineer who's working for the military industrial complex. And we can condemn the, the work of, the, of that engineer as being immoral, but we can't, our moral condemnation doesn't change the actual ac economic categories. So, but what's, what's significant about labor power, that's a commodity that's different from all other commodities, is that its use creates more value than it costs. Basically, all, in, all we're saying here, and what all of, it, of capitalist economics rests on is that it's possible for people working in factories under the prevailing necessary social conditions to just produce more than they need to consume to stay alive and to raise their families. It's a, it, it doesn't take a very high level of, of technology uh, for in a society to reach that point where people working hard all day can actually produce more than they absolutely need to consume and as soon as that happens, 
you have a surplus and as soon as you have a surplus there will be a social struggle will arise over who owns that surplus who controls it and what they're going to use it for we'll go back we'll come back to that question in a, in a future session where we'll we'll run through the different historical eras and the different ways in which that struggle played out but for now just focusing on capitalism uh, labor power is a commodity which when it is used up that is when it's put to work and produces actual labor the number of hours of labor that a person can work in a day is greater than the number of hours of labor that was necessary overall socially to produce that worker and keep them alive and keep them in a state to keep working so if everybody you know if everybody went to work and worked hard and the, the bakers baked and the teachers taught and the factory workers produced commodities and the construction workers built houses and and so on you know if all that work just was done just for the amount that was necessary to keep workers in a reasonable state of life you know that might using this as just an example it might take four hours work a day if everybody did all that work to, to keep workers um, supplied with what's necessary but at the end of four days you don't just get to go home your boss is still entitled to four more hours of your day typically in an eight hour work day or possibly even more so in the course of the the work day you've done four hours of work to replace the value of your wages which is what's the socially necessary um, labor time required to produce the commodities to, su to, to support you. But then there's another four hours worth of labor. And that belongs to the capitalist because he already paid for your labor power. So that out of that extra out of those extra four hours, we're using four as an example, it's not necessarily four hours and four hours, it might be um, it's probably actually significantly less than four hours. Uh, work in a day to produce what's everything that's necessary for workers uh, subsistence because automation has has uh, expanded so much but th whatever whatever number of hours it is over and above what strictly replaces all the commodities that the worker needs that surplus value that surplus labor and it's it's its value is just as much as the value of the work that you did that replaces your wages and that extra value belongs to the capitalist because they're the ones that owned the means of production they're the ones who did the hiring that's the essence of how a capitalist system works so exploitation is the appropriation of surplus value that is the fact that the capitalist gets the capitalist owns that value which is over and above the value of your wages it happens in every capitalist workplace it, does, it doesn't have to be an unusually bad workplace or unusually low wages. Exploitation is a basic component of any kind of capitalist production because there's already, the, the whole system is set up so that workers just keep, are expected to work to, to, do, to produce more than just replaces their own subsistence. Okay, um, so, there's a problem with this, of course, for the whole capitalist system, which is if you're paid, if your wages cover four hours worth of commodities, who's going to buy the other four hours worth? Uh, so historically, they would um, capitalism would seek out new markets. Uh, we'll talk about, much more about that in the next session. But the market's already globalized. There's just no more. There's really no more new markets to be found. I mean, the, the quality of markets could possibly be improved by increasing the spending power in different markets, but uh, geographically, there are no new markets. Uh, some of the excess can go into luxury and, ex and extravagance for wealthy people. Some of it can go into military expending, which is, you know, actually drains an incredible amount of, of uh, value out of the whole world economy. But the basic problem is that there are there's more and, and of course, a, a good deal that goes into being reinvested. Right, to create um, to increase the amount of production, but increase in production only increases the problem of the surplus of, of commodities over what the workers can afford to buy. 
So the, this basic problem is, is not going to go away. It's intrinsic to capitalism. It can only get worse. And it, it's the, what, what lies behind the periodic crises, the fact it was, what lies behind the business cycle is that uh, it, eventually there's more commodities produced than people have money to buy. And therefore the whole, the whole market cycle kind of collapses. So, so there's one there's one other aspect of, of economics that I wanted to touch on, um, which is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So this is the the tendency is it's a tendency. It doesn't mean that it absolutely must happen 100% of the time everywhere. But overall, there's a general tendency that way that that if the rate of profit is not going to fall all kinds of interventions by the state would have to take place to, to prop it up and to, to counteract this effect. So basically the way it works is, okay, if you work eight, again, using that same example, eight hours of work buys you four hours worth of commodities. The capitalist is taking 50% of your labor power, of your, sorry, of your labor time. But that's not their only cost. There's wear and tear on machinery, which has to be replaced. There's the cost of the, the uh, inputs to production and you know, certain, kinds, certain kinds of overhead of production. So their profit overall is much less than 50%. And the, the further the progress of technology and automation, that means the less labor time is actually required to produce each individual item because more and more of the process is actually done by the machines. Now, if a single capitalist invents or gets a patent for or implements a new technology, they can make a profit of the difference between their individual costs of production and the socially necessary cost. This is basically what patents are for. It, it's intended to protect uh, new inventions by giving them a, no, a monopoly for a certain amount of time. But eventually the whole society caps, catches up, like all of that branch of production will have the, the newest technology, the new socially necessary labor time to produce the product decreases because more automation means less labor is required for, to produce each individual item that's coming off of that assembly line or that machine. So the actual value of this, of the specific commodity goes down. But the cost of machinery typically hasn't gone down unless, <laughs> unless the making of the machines is also automated. So it's making labor more productive, but also the cost of the machinery becomes a bigger and bigger percentage of the overall investment. And th that profit has to come out of, the profit has to come from the surplus labor, but that's only a part of the overall costs, like the overall labor, which is also embodied in the machines that the capitalist had to buy. So the, the actual labor that any, any individual capitalist is hiring becomes a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall investment. And so the rate of profit goes down because the half of the labor time, which is all of the profit, is a smaller and smaller proportion of the overall cost of production, which includes not just the labor, but the machinery and and other costs. So, so this is a kind of science fiction exercise. It's, you know, some people have sometimes speculated about, about, well, what would happen if everything was completely automated and like nobody had to actually go into these factories at all. They were entirely run, run by robots and computers. So, well, it's never going to get to absolutely zero labor, but it's, it can approach that fair, you know, it can, it can actually get pretty close to zero compared to the way production was done 100 or 200 years ago. So it means less and less labor time is required to produce the commodities in general. The labor time gets close to zero, never really reaches zero, but so let's, let's assume that it does, it actually approaches zero. That means less labor, less labor time is required to produce the commodities including the commodities that sustain the workers and their families that they buy with their wages. So that means lower wages essentially would still be able to sustain 
the workers' subsistence. So the proportion of surplus labor to total labor will increase. So it, until it approaches 100% of the value of the labor. But the proportion of, la of live labor, labor that's being added to the materials and machinery at each step of production it is becoming smaller and smaller as things become automated. The amount of live labor added approaches zero as well. So if you had you know, a, this theoretical, completely automated industry with no labor, it would create no value because there's no socially necessary labor time. Therefore, it would create zero surplus value and there would be zero profit. So this is a, the basic conundrum for capitalists. I mean, through competition, they're pretty much compelled to innovate and to try to, to produce more efficiently. But at the same time, the closer, the more efficient the whole society becomes, the harder it, it becomes to find anywhere to extract profit from. So I'm going to stop there. I think I'm now just throw it open for discussion. So any, uh, any questions or any comments or any examples or any counterexamples 